For all the people participating in this webinar, we'd like to inform you that the webinar is being recorded and it will be published on the EFSA YouTube channel. Perhaps I'll just try and finish off uh, explaining about the different windows while we wait for Doreen to come back in. Um, so you will see the main presentations in the presentation window, but you have a QA box and this is really important because this is where you can ask us questions. Um, so you can, uh, if you want to ask questions specifically about the webinar, please use the QA box and you can just type your questions in there. And we have a, an elite team of um, our colleagues uh, in the data team who will be trying to respond to your questions and also put, passing those forward to presenters. Okay. And then um, we also have a technical chat, uh, which for GC Pettersen, who doesn't hear anything, please use the technical chat for that one because uh, our colleagues who are providing the support of the Adobe platform will be able to respond to you there. Um, okay, so that's an overview of the um, uh, how to uh, enjoy your meeting with us. And uh, I think we'll now move uh, towards the content of the presentation. And let's and see if Doreen pops back in a minute. But perhaps I'll introduce myself and Via as well first. So uh, obviously my name is Jane Richardson and I work for the data unit at EFSA. And uh, I'm one of the team of people who works very hard to receive the data that you send us, to give you advice and support when you're having problems, and then to make sure the data is of a good quality so that we can use it for risk assessment. Uh, and I'm also involved in making that information publicly accessible to citizens. And perhaps I can also in introduce my colleague Vaya. Vaya, please go ahead. My name is Vaya Mitula. Thank you, Jane, for the introduction. I hope that we have Doreen soon back with us. Um, I am also working for the data unit in EFSA, and I am um, a data steward, mostly working with contaminants and uh, with contaminants data. But as uh, Jane said, um, we are just trying to make sure that we are there helping you, supporting you in every step of the process of your transmission and validation of data uh, for ESA. And so we will try to do the exact same thing with this template here, which we believe that has kind of simplified, hopefully simplified the whole process for you. And we will make sure to take you step by step in uh, for this template to try to understand together right, how to do it. So um, just to give you um, a bit of background, um, EFSA receives a variety of data uh, from different uh, areas uh, for pesticides, for example, for veterinary residues, for contaminants. Uh, we also receive information for um, antimicrobial resistance and also zoonosis and, and also animal health issues. And we use what we call this SSD2 standard. We use this because by using a standard, it means that uh, uh, people in Europe who have to send the data should more or less be able to use the same format uh, independently. So if you have the results of laboratory testing for a hazard in food, you will be able to use this uh, standardized format. Uh, obviously, when we're using standardized formats across Europe, uh, we have to do various things uh, so that the data is comparable. And one of these is to use coding. And this is most probably the most complicated part of the SSD2 standard, but we're going to talk you through the types of coding that you're going to have to use, the template that's going to be uh, demonstrated and um, uh, uh, uses this coding, but you, you'll be able to see how, how that's applied. Um, and uh, we also um, need you to submit that data through our data collection framework. Uh, and this means that all of the data is gathered together so we can test and verify it. Um, what we're going to try and focus on today is more of the chemical contaminants. We're focusing on the reasonably uh, simple submissions uh, where you're largely reporting the results of the measurement of chemicals um, by a laboratory uh, in food samples. And that's going to be the focus of the presentation today. Uh, I think Vaya is going to step in and give a little bit more background information. Thank you, Vaya. Of course. So, okay. Um, so what the aim of the webinar um, was, what the idea behind this webinar was, 
was to give you a little bit more information and step-by-step -step guidance on how to fill in the specific template that we're going to have a look on, uh, at today. So um, I can just try to explain a bit more about how the simplified template, so the simplified Excel template works and what it is, uh, what is it designed to be and uh, who can actually use it. Um, so we have developed that, EFSA has developed that template for uh, to allow data providers so people, of course, that have the data, to input the laboratory analytical results uh, on chemical contaminants and additives in food. And the structure of the Excel um, is in the format that, as uh, Jane already explained, um, can, um, I'm sorry, can help you to transmit standard sample description or SSD2 uh, samples. And the advantage of having the data in SSD2 includes the possibility to basically have greater refinement in the scientific assessments that are um, performed in EFSA. Now, in the tool, you can see already, I hopefully, hopefully you can see it in your screens already, um, you can see that it has um, different color in the column headings. And here in the part that we're looking at now, I will take control now so I can show you the rest. All right. Okay, so the color headings. Excellent. So, Vaya, you're going to Sorry. try and take us through the sheet. Would you like me to, to talk you through the completion of it while you show everyone how to use it? Uh, absolutely. But I was thinking to first just have an overview maybe of the, um, of the formatting so that yeah, everyone becomes a bit more familiar. Is it fine, Jane? And then we can take it step by step. Okay. So, um, what is the interesting part of the template and basically the parts that we believe are going to be very helpful for you are that here we have included all the elements that um, you should fill in to have good data quality. So you can see that each individual column is a different element. And you can also uh, look at the column headings where you can see that, for example, in this part of the template, they are red. But then if we move on a bit further to the right, let me see, I do not know if you can see me move it now. Okay, so if we move a bit further to the right, we should find column, col uh, column headings of different colors. So we, in this way, we are covering the mandatory elements that have a red column heading, um, the pre-filled elements, which is a couple of them in green column headings, and then we also have some elements that are that are not mandatory to fill to be filled in, and they are in orange column uh, headings. And um, it is also very helpful to see, and we can see, we will see this while filling in information in the template, that by navigating with your mouse on the column heading, in a lot of columns, you will see that there is a comment, and these comments give, give you information about what data, uh, what data EFSA expects you to provide. So there you can find the EFSA code, and then the relevant explanation of this code. And um, to fill in this template, we have, of course, uh, and instructions document giving you specific instructions for all the different codes and explanations of how to fill it in. And, and of course, you can always uh, go back to the guidance document, which is the new uh, guidance document published by EFSA um, for the chemical data collection of 2020. Um, so you can always reference these documents to make sure that you fill it in as best as possible. And I think that now, Jane, we can start by looking at sure. each individual and, element. And these links are going to be shared after we've shown the Excel file as well, isn't it? So you'll be able to take note of the important links that you need when completing this file. Okay, so let's get started, Mary. Yes. Although right now I do not think... Sorry, just give me a second to make sure that I have the access we need so that we... Don't slow down. Okay. okay, I can do it. Perfect. So first of all, we need to provide a program ID. And yes. this allows us to know where a group of samples have been taken for a specific purpose. Uh, there is no specific terminology applied here. You can create your own code. But say, for example, you've decided to do a specific monitoring program. Or, for example, if you're in industry, you have, for example, a specific air quality control process uh, where you check, for example, for contaminants then you can group these samples and say these samples were taken under a specific purpose. Excellent. So this one, in this case, we're saying that these are um, samples for tetrahydrocarbonyls in 2019. 
And next, we need to um, provide the legal reference. So for EFSA, it's very important to know under which legal framework uh, samples were taken. This is because we receive uh, information from a variety of different legal frameworks. And in some cases, uh, we need to provide specific reports or feedback uh, based on the different legal requirements. So you can see in the nice drop down box, you can select uh, the main legal requirements that are related to data submission to EFTA. And if you select, for example, 178 2002, once you select that uh, item, the code immediately appears. So in this case, you don't need to know the code, you just need to know the legislation. And 178 2002 can be used where there is no specific legislation, for example, for the substance that you wish to report. Next up, we need to give uh, some kind of indication about how the samples were selected. And this is in the column called sample strategy. So, um, for example, if we want to say um, that every sample could be equally, ah, Bias just highlighting very nicely that there's a little pop-up comment box that allows you to see the key codes that you might need to use. Uh, so in this case, we've been using STO20A, which means uh, selective sampling. So this means um, that a specific uh, populations have been targeted for the sampling, but within that population, a sample has an equal chance of being sampled. Uh, there is obviously objective, which is for truly random sampling, but you can also indicate, for example, if it's a convenient sample. So you just took samples uh, where you could find them. Then we need to give an indication of the program type. And again, we can see um, some examples of the different types. Uh, in this case, we're using a scenario where you might be an industry that wants to provide information. So we will select an industry sample. And then um, you need to also identify what type of sampler did, did this. And this is normally straightforward. It's normally either uh, official control sampling or for industry sampling. So we can select the appropriate code there. Excellent, well done, Vi. And um, then we need to indicate where the sample was taken. So what, at what point in the food chain was the sample taken? Again, in this case, uh, you just need to select uh, the text from the drop down box and then uh, the code will fill automatically. So I think we're going to consider that this is an, an example where the sample is taken at the manufacturing plant. Um, obviously for us knowing the point of sampling is really important, particularly when we're dealing with things like contaminants. It's important to know uh, how, where in the food chain the contamination might have occurred and this then will allow, for example, the authorities in the member states to take mitigation attitudes mitigation measures. Next, we come to one of the very important uh, values in the uh, SSD2 uh, data reporting, which is the sample ID. I'll just see if uh, I can shuffle the Excel sheet along. Yes, I'm trying. Okay, I think maybe now we'll be able to just to move it Excellent. a bit further to the right. Okay, Perfect. so um, the sample ID, again, is basically you can enter any value that you like. But what's really important is where you have uh, tested a sample for more than one different substance, which is quite frequent, that all of those results have the same sample ID. This is really important. It's most probably the most critical part of filling in the SSD2 because then it allows us to know cases where more than one substance, for example, is detected in the same sample. So uh, the first three samples there were for EFSA test one, and this one we're going to increment it by one to make it EFSA test two. And this means that we're indicating a new sample. So above we see a case of one sample where three different substances were tested for, and we're going to start a new sample, um, the first row of that. Then we need to know um, where the samples were taken. Obviously, we're now we're into those critical things like time and place, which we need to know about sampling. So we ask you to report which country the sample was taken from. I think in this example, we're, we're pretending we're Germany. Again, you have a, a drop-down box, and this is very simple because it uses the ISO uh, Alpha 2 
uh, coding system for countries and then we can fill in the date when the sample was taken and we really do ask you to provide a full date when the sample was taken. Uh, knowing when a sample is taken it is very important. So you need to enter the year first. Then the month using the, the number rather than the name. So in this case June and then the day. Excellent. And now we come to perhaps the most complicated part uh, of the coding, which is to provide the um, FoodX2 code for the sample taken. So FoodX2 offers a range of what we call base terms, which are normally a, a simple code of around five let numbers and letters. So in the example here, you can see that the base term for T has been used. Uh, in both for this sample and the sample that we're reporting. Um, however, one of the things that we do advise is that for this part, you also take a look at the webinar series that was already recorded last year on um, how to use Foodex. So again, there will be links uh, at the end of this presentation uh, to the original webinars given specifically on how to do Foodex 2 coding. Um, and also we recommend that for this part you use the EFSA catalog browser and again uh, the training on the EFSA catalog browser is included in these webinars. Um, the system is very good because it allows you to describe um, the product in quite a detailed way and that's why we don't go into it specifically here because it's really it's been a subject of its own webinar uh, and that's the best place to find out about it. So we've now put in the base term for T and we need to also indicate where the origin of that product was. So uh, it may be in the same place as where the sample was taken, but we do live in a globalized marketplace. So quite frequently the uh, origin is different from the place where the sample was taken. And in particular, sometimes we need to look and see if there are differences between EU products and third country products. I'll just explain a bit about fishing area because this is not a, a mandatory element. Yes. Um, again, it has the option where you can select some text and the uh, code pops up uh, by magic. Um, but um, this is only really required when you're taking samples from the aquatic environment. So obviously for a tea sample, we wouldn't expect to have the uh, fishing area filled in. Um, but for if you, for example, were taking samples of mackerel or tinned fish products, for example, then knowing the fishing area would be more important. Uh, so that's our sample described. And perhaps, Vaya, do you think it's possible to show how to do uh, a copy in case we wanted to report uh, another uh, result for the same sample? So basically, once you've entered your sample information once, uh, if, for example, you're testing for a large range of substances, uh, say 10 or 11 different uh, substances, um, then um, it's much easier just to copy the sample information into for the number of results that you have, uh, and then you can and then uh, you can just fill out the result exactly. information. So I was just going to show you how to do that. So this really, it's quite important that you use approach a bit like this um, because um, it's very important when you submit the data that the sample information is uniform. So if you have, for example, the information that was copied there, uh, if you have the same sample ID and you don't have the same information, uh, then you might receive an error when you submit the sample because it expect, expects the sample information to be uh, uniform. Okay, so now we're going to put in the year when the analysis is performed. Again, this is quite a straightforward one, it's simply the, the year. And then we also ask for the laboratory. Uh, so this can be a code uh, or however you want to name it. But this allows us to understand if uh, samples have been taken in the same laboratory. And then we also record some information about the laboratory status. So um, 
let's put in a lab ID. So we're imagining this is the LRL, but you can simply put the uh, company lab, for example, if you're an industry partner. Um, it, it's fine, um, but it's just useful to know where samples were tested in the same laboratory. Then you can indicate whether the laboratory is accredited or not. So again, there's a little pop-up uh, comments box on this one, which shows you the various codes that you can select. So we'll most probably select L001A, which is accredited. Exactly, there's the, the pop-up box. Uh, so uh, you can also have third-party assessment, for example, if you're not ISO accredited, for example. Um, then we need to enter in uh, the country where the laboratory is. Um, many uh, laboratories provide testing across Europe, so this is the reason why we ask for this information. And then we need to provide uh, an information which is called the param type. Now, in some cases, uh, we need to measure a number of different uh, components or metabolites or residues, and then the actual value that we might use to see if um, the value is below a, a legal limit requires summing. Uh, so in this case, there are codes called uh, P002A and P005A, uh, which require you to, um, to to provide this information. But in this case, where you're just reporting a, a, an individual substance uh, that doesn't require any summing, you can use the code P001A. Okay, that's great. Uh, then we need to provide the param code. Uh, now, again, uh, this is one where we recommend that you use the catalog browser. We have a lot of different codes uh, for the parameter uh, because we have a, a catalog of thousands of substances. So if you use the catalog browser, you can very easily look up the substance that you want to report. But also what we try to do is, particularly when it's a call for data, uh, we try to publish the codes that are needed um, so that you can see um, what are the codes and what are the substances. And we try to give a shorter, more specific list of the substances that we're interested in. Uh, so um, we've now added our param code. Um, then we also need to provide a code for the method. Um, this can be, again, something, uh, this is your own value. It can come from the lab. And ideally, what we're looking to do is to know uh, which substance, which tests have come from a validated method within the laboratory or one that's under third party assessment, for example. So uh, these were all done under the, the T uh, method. Um, obviously, the, the type of method tends to be dependent also not just on the substances you're looking for, but also on the laboratory equipment and the type of matrix that's being analyzed. Great. And then we need to um, indicate what type of method we have and what type of equipment we're using. So for the method type, if we just hover, hover over the comments box, you can see that there are two options here. Uh, one which is uh, confirmation and uh, one which is screening. So as a general rule, we prefer to receive confirmation results because these are numerically quantifiable results or results which could be numerically quantifiable if it was detectable. Um, but uh, you can also, oh, you can, <laughs> Francesco is keen to get in touch with you by <laughs> that. You can uh, report uh, screening results in case they are, mm -hmm. um, you're using a biological test. Um, however, generally for this type of reporting, we expect quantifiable results. And then you should s select the type of laboratory equipment that you would use for the analysis. So in this case, we're, this was GCMS. And again, with this case, you have a list to select from, and then uh, the code should okay. pop up automatically. Um, there may be cases where, for example, you can't find a code uh, for EFSA. Um, and uh, in this case, the best thing to do is to, the 
best thing to do is to send an email to ESSA, to, to the people who are here in the uh, webinar today, um, and you can request a code from us. We'll do an analysis to see if the code already exists, and if it doesn't, uh, then we will look one up. So say if you've bought some of the latest laboratory equipment in your laboratory, uh, and you feel that that laboratory equipment is not described in the list of codes that we provided, um, then you can ask us for a code. And this applies to any of the coding that's used. For those things where there are quite short lists of clearly defined codes, it's unlikely that we will issue you a new code. But certainly if you're measuring a substance uh, that doesn't appear to have a code, let us know and we'll give you a code so you can report it. Right, I think we're just waiting for the technical team to put the Excel sheet back up again. Excellent, thank you very much. And uh, Bio will just try and put GCMS in. Or in fact, it's Carla who's helping out. Hi, Carla, thank you very much. GCMS, well done. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's move along and look at Res ID, the green field that you can see now. So um, this is the result ID. We ask for a unique identifier for every row of results that are reported. Um, and this means that if we ever need to talk to you about a result, we can give you this ID and you know which result we're talking about. Because sometimes we might have to come back to you and ask questions. Particularly if we're using uh, your results uh, in, a, in a risk assessment, and uh, there's a, uh, we need additional information, maybe more details on the sample, for example. So uh, this is filled in automatically by the sheet, and it creates a unique uh, number by combining the sample ID and the parameter code. Next up, we need to um, indicate whether the procedure was accredited or not. Again, this is a, a pop-up box, which should give us uh, some options. That's it, lovely. A, column A, C, select from the pop-up box. So we go for the first one accredited, according to ISO, which will be the first one in the drop-down. Excellent, thank you. So that's V001. And now in column A, E, we need to indicate um, what are the units that we're measuring in. So today we're using micrograms per kilogram. It's really important when you're reporting the data that if you report any numeric information in the following columns, uh, that they're all in the same unit. So please don't report an LOQ using one unit and a VAL in another unit. You need to use the same units consistently for each row of data that you submit. Next up, we need to provide the LOQ, which is in column AG. This is just simply entering a numeric value. And since we're using the same method, we would expect the LOQ to be the same, 0.03. Thank you very much. Uh, just to say, this is a mandatory field, and it's very important for us. Um, the type of information that we have is called left sensor data. We do have a guidance document on this. And uh, we use the LOQ to, uh, to adjust for left sensor data. So uh, this is also uh, really a critical value to complete. OK, now we need to go along a little bit towards the ResVal, because I think in this case we're going to say that we were able to detect the substance. So, OK, so ResVal AH, that's the one we're looking for. OK, so um, this was above the LOQ, so we're most probably looking at about 0.01 as the measured value that was detected. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Sorry, Jane. I, I mean, the, the, the number that you indicated, if you could please repeat it. Well done. OK. Now, the next columns, uh, there's a few here that you can or are, are optional. So the res LOD in column AF is optional. Um, you can report it if you have the LOD, uh, but the LOQ is generally uh, the preferred value. 
Um, you can also report in the columns uh, res val rec and a res val rec corrected. You can indicate uh, if uh, your um, your value has been adjusted for recovery and what uh, the uh, recovery value was for the sample, but this is not mandatory. In addition, you can also uh, report, for example, samples by fat weight. So if the substance that you're measuring uh, is fat soluble and tends to be found largely in fat, uh, then you can report results by fat weight using the express res type and the express res percent. So from the type, you can select fat weight, and then you can provide the percentage fat in your sample. But in this case, we most probably don't need to complete that. Then we also have the option to provide uh, the results as negative or positive using res qualval. This should only be used in cases where you've used a screening test where you only have positive or negative. So again, uh, we prefer that you provide quantitative results or results that are below uh, LOQ, but you provide the LOQ. Next up, we need to provide the res type. So we need to select VAL from column AN. OK, lovely. Um, and you can see that the other results that have been reported were uh, reported as LOQ. Uh, you can also report LOD if you are reporting a result at LOD, but you would need to complete the res LOD column if that's what you do. And then finally, we just need to fill out the eval code. So um, in this case, um, you um, can select whether if the sample has a legal limit, you can uh, indicate whether it is above or below that legal limit. However, um, if the, there is no legal limit applicable or you're not um, taking result tests for compliance against uh, particular levels specified in legislation, you can use the code JO29A, which means result not evaluated. So perhaps we'll just show that example here for that, set, that sample. Uh, and this can be used uh, in any case where there's no assessment against the legal limit. And um, we've then managed to uh, complete our result. So thank you very much, Vavaya, for typing that in. And I thought I saw Doreen back briefly, but she seems to have disappeared again. Okay. So well done, Vaya. Do you want to see if we can do export to XML as a special test, or at least show the guys where you would find it? Shall we give it a go? OK, so um, once you've got... Oh, yes, absolutely. Maybe not. <laughs> okay, I think in which case, uh, we'll, uh, if anyone wants to know about that, we'll uh, send some information out afterwards. Um, but perhaps if you put, oh, okay, sorry. Do you want to try, Vaya? Yes, so I'm trying now. Okay, maybe we just go to the question and no. answer now. Okay, so I think we can maybe hand over to some of the questions. I see that people yeah. have been, uh, there's a lot of questions in the, in the comp, on the Q&A, but there are some specific questions for us. So let's have a, a look and see what we've got. Uh, so one of the questions is to uh, repeat um, the legislation to using column C if there is no specific legislation in place for a specific contaminant. So in this case, uh, you can use the, the code for the general food law, which um, describes the uh, legal basis for EFSA to collect this data, which is 178-2002, although we might need to update that with the new transparency regulation at some point. Um, so in question two, do you want to try this one, Maya? I'll hand over to you, give my voice a rest. Can you see it? it was, there was a little bit of a connectivity problem earlier in the webinar. Where could they find the Excel spreadsheet? Yes. Yeah, so thank you for this question. Indeed, um, you can, first of all, you can find all the documents that we have mentioned in the links that you can see now in the screen. Um, so you can see that the first one, if I'm not mistaken, is for the template. And you can see that you can find it in um, 
Uh, no, I am mistaken. So you can find the template and also the instructions how, on how to fill in the specific template. Um, okay, in that's the great. So you can see the links are on so the screen in the uh, and they're available. So just to uh, explain, um, we have a uh, on Zenodo, yeah. we have a community called Knowledge Junction. Uh, where we supply, we share quite a wide variety of different information that be, can be used uh, by people who are preparing for data collections. So it's always worth to take a look on there. Um, we also provide information, for example, on, on some rules that might be applied to your data. All of our catalogues can be downloaded from there. And also, um, we try to publish data now. So um, particularly if you're in the research area, you might be looking to access the data that EFSA has available. It's in the format that you've had described to you today, and you can download that data from Knowledge Junction. This is published after we've completed the scientific assessment using the data. Uh, exactly. So maybe you can look at the next we have. Um, so the question asks, uh, rather than having to scroll down, can you maybe write? This will save, uh, save, of course, a lot of time instead of choosing, for example, from the long list of countries, uh, country abbreviations. And the answer is that um, specifically for the example of countries, yes, you can type in. Um, and um, Excel will accept your answer as valid as long as what you are typing in is exactly what is provided in the list. So in the cases of the country, for example, I would say that, yes, go ahead and please type in the um, abbreviation yourself. But then for a bit of longer options, like, for example, the regulation that you're going to choose or um, the analysis method, I would suggest that you take the time to scroll down and choose the Great. proper and code. Then, uh, we have a question saying, uh, should the data be submitted in this format during a crisis situation attached to a RASF notification? Um, yes, you can use this uh, format for submitting uh, individual result level data. There was a presentation earlier this week on race, which is lim linked to the RASAF aspects. So this, this format can be used for RASAF notification, but you would still have to fill out the formal RASAF notification in the system um, for the, the product, etc in particular because you need to provide also the information related to forward and back tracing. But if you have the results of the laboratory test in, a, in an Excel file in this format, that's a great format to upload because it means that if other people are using the same format, we can easily combine it. Uh, oh, okay, now this is a really interesting one. Uh, it says, if I'm not mistaken, there is no FoodEx code for feed additives, when we, can we expect them? Well, actually, um, there has just been a specific guidance uh, published um, conjointly with uh, our expert on FoodEx2, which actually makes recommendations for how to describe feed, uh, particularly for both additives measuring, but also for reporting testing for veterinary medicinal residues. So um, perhaps our colleagues in the Q&A team uh, can also post uh, the link to the guidance uh, for um, FoodEx2 for feed. But this is a, a guidance that came out this year, and it's a really important uh, document for that. Ah, and it also says, when are the deadlines for the submission? So um, formally, uh, we open, our data collection is actually already open now. So if you want to try and send some data immediately, um, you can you can start this afternoon. The the data collection is open and it's ready to receive your information. And uh, Baya will be one of the people who will be talking back to you uh, <laughs> if you have any problems. Uh, so if you were let her know if you were in this uh, webinar as well, because it's always nice to to get to know people better. Um, so you can already start submitting now. Um, the data collection, the data collection framework. Generally, we try to close it um, by the uh, end of August or the end of September. I think also for contaminants, you have a bit longer, so you have the end of September. But this is also available in the call, which has just been published on the EFSA website. So if you take a look on the EFSA website, you will find that for contaminants, I think you can actually see the link up there already. All the information about submitting uh, contaminants occurrence data is there. 
um, including the deadlines and the tools that you would need and any other information you need. Do you want to have a go on accreditation? <coughs> Is, uh, could you clarify the difference between the accreditation in the lab and of the procedure? Or shall I take that one? Yes, this is exactly what I'm checking now. And I can also see that we have um, the exact definition of all the elements and also of the codes and their descriptions in um, our instructions for complete the simplified template. So I'm also checking the instructions now. And indeed, the difference would be that the accreditation for the lab, and maybe we could ba go back to the template, but I don't know if it is wise to try that. Um, so, in this small list that you have in the template, you can see that you have three options. You have the option of the lab being accredited, uh, the lab having a third-party assessment, or even having none. And let's see if I can show, you, show this to you right now. Okay. So let's move to the section of the template that um, is regarding information about the laboratory that performed the analysis. Okay. Okay, so you can see here from the three codes that are available to choose from, the options that I have already shown you. So this has to do with the laboratory that performs the analysis itself. Then, and you can see that it can be none. Then if we move a bit further down to the method, um, that, the specific method that was used for the analysis, Okay. Maybe just to add that in terms of, ah, oh, well done. So that's the uh, accreditation of the method as well. Yes, it's right here. So, yes. So basically, you can see that it, uh, it is also regarding um, w whether there is a specific protocol for this method. And for example, you can see here that the, the first option that we actually use in our example is that the method was being accredited according to ISO or that it was internally validated. So this gives us also some information about what the different laboratories are using and how different samples or different um, compounds in uh, the same samples have been uh, um, I think the analyzed. Um, Jane, I don't know if you would like to add something to more. <coughs> some questions for you. But just to go back to accreditation. So, for yeah. example, there are cases, uh, particularly for the methods, where an EURL or potentially your NRLs um, specify specific methods that need to be used uh, within the laboratory. And this can be indicated with the method accreditation. So, if there is a piece of legislation by the EURL specifically for the methods that you should be using, then you can also use this uh, field to indicate that. Uh, but this is more applicable to um, national and EU level monitoring schemes, not necessarily applied uh, to industry. Would you like to do the one about um, missing code? Um, and uh, then I can... Yes, exactly. One of the next questions, and it is actually very interesting, um, and it asks, uh, what do we do when a code is not yet present in the spreadsheet? Can we add these codes manually, or does it have uh, does it have to be done by EFSA? And so, as we have already mentioned, while looking at the template itself, you can see that we have all these codes in the drop-down list that are available. If you don't find the, co the code that you consider relevant in this list, which for the majority of times, you should find all the options available in the spreadsheet. You can always go back to the EFSA catalog browser. And there you can see all the different catalogs, including all the different codes that are available for, um, for reporting data. Now, if you really identify the need of using another code and you believe that the codes available do not cover your needs, what you should do is contact us and then we'll try to resolve this with you. It is not that often that we're actually adding codes because you can understand that it affects also the existing codes and the catalogs and also the guidance document. But in case that indeed the code is great. Um, and perhaps I'll try and answer this question about the reporting hierarchy. So yes, if you select uh, FoodX2 codes from the reporting hierarchy, they should be reportable and therefore you won't have a problem with sending your data. 
In fact, you can select different hierarchies, but the, the coding that you use actually will be the same. The hierarchy is more used, uh, one, to group uh, substances that can be reported for specific reasons, but we also use them um, in order to generate the reports. That's why they're called reporting hierarchy. Um, so the code, I mean, the code for acrylamide will always be the code for acrylamide, independent of which hierarchy you select. Um, but the reporting hierarchy is the default hierarchy for su submitting data through the DCF for uh, this data collection and, in fact, any chemical monitoring data collection. And then there's a question about in case where samples have been submitted, uh, results non-compliant and this have been resampled. Um, yes, you can uh, report uh, if the samples are taken at a it, during a different sampling event, so at a later date, um, then you can uh, report that. Um, but you should indicate, for example, that these are suspect sampling now because you've already had a non-compliance. However, we kindly request, uh, as far as possible, that for a specific sample taken on a specific type from a specific uh, matrix, um, that you report only one result. Generally, that is our requirement. Uh, so this can be, uh, for example, if you only have one result, that's quite straightforward. Um, but for example, if you have for some reason taken multiple tests for compliance testing, um, then you should report, for example, the average or whatever is recommended under the legislation. Fire, do you want to try official in industry? Okay, I'll take that one then. Um, yeah, uh, so I mean, this one's quite straightforward. Uh, go by it. Um, yes, I could give it a go. Okay, thank you. Okay, no worries. So this one's quite straightforward. Um, no. Obviously, when you're involved in a national or European uh, monitoring program, for example, that required for pesticides or for veterinary residues, then we would expect, expect you to report official sampling because these are samples that are often taken according to a national plan that has already been provided to the regulatory authorities. Industry sampling more relates to cases where industry itself performs its own checks to ensure the safety of the product and wishes to provide that information to EFSA to support risk assessments, particularly if those risk assessments are involved in setting safe levels, for example, for a particular substance in product or product. Okay, um, it looks like we're coming, oh, no, there's another one coming. Okay, yeah, so, um, our Q&A team has just indicated that there are some questions, uh, so that there are some questions related to one of the other mapping tools that we provide. Okay, so what we're talking about here, this, this, this session is really designed as an entry route into reporting to EFSA. So we're focusing on the simple super simplified template because this is the easiest way to report. Um, it allows you to um, it allows you to report in a simple way. You have uh, drop downs. It doesn't provide all of the values um, that can be provided um, because we want to keep it easy for you. So. Um, we recommend if you've not reported to ESSA before, if you only take a small number of samples, if you're only reporting, for example, results for one specific substance or for a small group of samples, then the super simplified is most probably well suited to your needs. If, for a, however, you have a, a large scale uh, national monitoring program uh, where you're reporting thousands of samples with a very broad scope, the Super Simplified most probably isn't the tool that you need to use, and we do have other tools available, and these are also published on Zenodo. So this would be a good point for you to check. 
but this this presentation is really uh, focusing on um, this this presentation is uh, really focused on um, how to do the super simplified. Uh, sorry, and I was asked to clarify on official and industry sampling. Uh, generally, we would expect to see either official or industry sampling. However, if there is a case, I think there is some sampling schemes where, for example, there is a legal uh, requirement for samples to be taken. This is more in the uh, microorganisms area where, for example, I think uh, te testing of pig skin uh, at slaughter is required more from the industry. Uh, but this is under an official uh, sampling program. So you could use it in these cases, but I think generally uh, you should stick to either industry or uh, official sampling unless you really have a strong case for reporting official and industry sampling. This is only used in rare cases. Okay, um, it seems now that uh, thanks to FastWeb, I am the last survivor. Uh, on the internet from the presenting team today. Uh, I'm just... I feel like sorry. sorry. Jane, I'm so sorry. It's just my sound. Oh, Doreen, you're there. Jane, okay, I'm we're all here. Now. It's just the sound. Okay, so it seems that uh, yeah, Doreen and um, Maya... I here. don't put my camera on. Okay, so you're on the audio. Um, okay, well, in which case then, Doreen, maybe I hand to you a little bit to close the session, if you would like. But I mean, I'd just like to say that um, uh, this is the first, uh, this is the second uh, virtual webinar that we've done. Uh, we're learning. Uh, we can see that there are still occasionally some technical issues that are difficult to resolve. So we're sorry for that, and we thank you for your patience. Uh, you've been very kind, and uh, I hand over to Doreen to close. Okay, thank you, Jane, and thank you, Via, and thank you both so much because I don't know what happened, but I was repeatedly kicked out of the uh, of the webinar. So um, obviously, there's a local issue with my internet connection. Um, I don't really know if you covered everything. I, I managed to get in every so often and see you were doing the template. So I really hope for all the people who participated that. It, it is clearer now what kind of information EFSA is seeking from you. I've had a look at some of the questions in the chat area as well, and it seems like you had lots of uh, lots of feedback and lots of further questions relating to this webinar. So, um, really, I wouldn't hesitate. I, I, my closing remark would be: don't hesitate to contact us if you have any problems at the data dot collection. <coughs> excuse me, at EFSA.eu functional mailbox, and uh, we, they, they will be answered by our dedicated team to, who can support you and help so, you. Thank you very much. Um, you have access to the uh, useful links, and uh, we do have the email address, data.collection at EFSA.europa.eu, and these are, uh, there you go, it's up on the screen. Thanks very much, Carla. So, um, if you have questions after this, or once you start to submit your um, information, uh, you have any questions, um, please uh, use that email address. You'll go through what we call our ServiceNow system, but uh, the people who've been responding to you today, both through the oral presentation and through the question and answers, will the people who will be there to support you, and they're an amazing team. So uh, I know that you will be able to get your data to EFSA.